Salmon is a key focal species in um, one of our regional land use plans that we um, are doing with Tong Quichin Council and Carcross Tagish First Nation. And salmon is a focal key species in that plan along with caribou. And it also, it aligns with our um, chapter 16 final agreements and it's part of our land's vision. And a land's vision, I don't know if you guys have ever seen what it is, I always keep it here right beside me, is um, our citizens developed this um, a few years back and it's, um, 2016, am I right? 2016, I was It might be a 2017. It's up on the yeah, uh, 2016. Google, uh, page for our course as well. If you want to have a look at it, um, it's on. I was right, Duncan, May 2016. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. It was approved by council. But anyway, what it is, is, uh, is a vision that was brought forth with engagement with our citizens and what their values and principles were and what we should focus on as our land's vision, as our department, what we focus and on, on how we do make our decisions and what we how we conduct our work is based on that land's vision. So it's really important that we follow along with that. And um, Quillen Dunn recognizes our Quillen Dunn people I shouldn't say well and done people because done means people. Um, well and done focuses on um, that we identify ourselves as salmon people. We have lived along the river and been a part of the river for millennia. And salmon was one of our main uh, sources of food seasonally um, along with other freshwater fish when we went in the winter to ice fish and caribou. So, um, Salmon was a lifeline. It, it meant everything to us. It kept us alive. I'll give you a quote from one of our elders that um, Louis Smith, he's, he's still alive today. He said, he said to me one time, he says, you must uh, protect the salmon. You must save the salmon. If it wasn't for salmon, there would not be one Indian left in the Yukon. We would have all starved to death. We must save the salmon. It's our turn to save the salmon. So um, there's a real um, holistic connection there. And it's something that is, it's, it brings us back to the river. It's everything to us. So when we identify with salmon, you see, you know, you see our cultural center, it has salmon in it. You see our stories about our spiel along the river. Um, and uh, so bringing all of this together and all these plans and everything that we have with salmon, once you see this presentation, you'll see all the connections and how, how much work we put into this. And Dennis has been my key partner in helping me achieve this with our First Nations, with their vision. So going forward, we can do that. And Dennis, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Um, no, I'm good. I'd like to actually just, I'll load up. I, you don't mind if I share a screen, do you, Duncan? I'll just uh, load my presentation up. I think I yep, can do it. Go ahead. I think I'm good. Um, I'd like to hear from um, I'd like to hear from Shirley Harlan and Rianne what uh, yeah a little bit about uh, yourselves and maybe yeah, that's good, your, yeah. your connection to salmon. I don't know uh, anyone who wants to jump in there and start. Where Rianne, you're. I could go first. Okay, go ahead, Shirley. Um. Is my camera on? I can't see myself. Yeah, oh, yeah you're there good. I am. Yeah. Um, so, okay. Um, my name's Shirley Jock, and um, my mother is from Barrens River First Nation in Manitoba, and my dad is Taku River Clinket First Nation, and I currently live on uh, Taku River Clinket territory here in Atlin. And um, my relation to salmon, I have been raised on salmon. I've ate salmon my whole life. I'm very blessed to do so, thankful for that. Um, and I think as Taka River Clingate people, we're, we acknowledge ourselves as salmon people as well um, from the Taku River. And um, one other thing, I got the opportunity to work um, for our nations, one of our salmon weirs this past summer and that was really interesting and um, we were on Kuthai Lake and over the last decade I would say like the numbers that had the salmon that were coming up they were in the hundreds 
over the last decade. And so when me and my partner were there, we had over 5,000 salmon come through the weir, which was really amazing. And um, our lands and fish department were super stoked to see those numbers. And so, um, yeah, I don't know. I love salmon. Yeah. That's great. That's a little bit of what I wanted to share. No, that's, that's really great. Cause I know Brandy and I can tie that into today's presentation because the TRT is, is a big part of this as well, actually, believe it or not. Yeah. Right on. Um, Rianne, what yourself? Hi, uh, Ryan uh, Peterson. I am Gwich'in uh, from the Northwest Territories. Um, I know that there is also Gwich'in in the Yukon. Um, I am taking uh, this course uh, uh, gratefully through correspondence. I'm still in Yellowknife. I'm in Yellowknife right now. And um, yeah, I, I don't have much um, relationship with salmon, but uh, my, my people, the Gwich'in people, um, have probably a similar relationship with the caribou, much as you have with the salmon. And um, I know I, I read an article today uh, that uh, Brandy, uh, I think it was you in the article, you talked about salmon um, as a way of life and your survival. And I feel like the Gwich'in people very much um, feel the same way about caribou. Thank you for, for coming today and to, for presenting to, to us. Thanks, Rand. Um, which do you mind asking which community in uh, in the in uh, in which in NWT country you're from? I'm from Fort McPherson. Okay, great. Well, I know I know in Sigachik and places like that, they're starting to catch salmon in their nets. This is a big big deal, actually. There's a lot of a lot of interest in salmon moving into the Mackenzie, and why they're straying in that in that area now. Pretty interesting. So wow. I, I love my fish sticks, and uh, I. Uh, I love my white fish out of, out of uh, Fort McPherson too, so. Dry That's fish, good. it's very, very good. <laughs> very good, yeah. Harlan, what about yourself? Oh, hello, well, welcome, uh, Brandy, and it's a pleasure meeting you, Dennis. Um, my my family's actually originally from Telegraph Creek, so we're Taltans, actually, and uh, as you're probably familiar with, uh, the Stikine River has uh, been a, a great uh, Salmon River for many many years. That is actually changing I, I, as we speak, right? You know, that's I think that's the part of the talk you all talk about. But as uh, I guess as, as a young man, I did learn to cut enacaga, which is dry salmon, right? And uh, so I know how to work around a fish house fairly well. I know how to run a net, and so I know that the practical purpose of how to run a net and all that stuff. But I'm not a, a a really good traditionalist like uh, I know some of the old stories about uh, about salmon and how uh, that that type of thing but uh, like I said I'm not a great traditionalist when it comes to a Taltan person but but I, I spend a lot of time in the fish house and know how to do a lot of the mechanical stuff. Um, what else? So salmon has been very important to Taltan people it has historically uh, I think brought even conflict amongst our neighbors uh, of the uh, of a, a trade or being in that s food source. So at times we haven't been good neighbors to our other uh, other groups around us, but at the same time, it has brought us together with other neighbors too and intermarriages and families. So it, it actually is is a big impact on our, uh, on our, our, on our nation. And uh, to this day, uh, I think even some years ago, about 10 years ago, some of the elders were talking about Jesus salmon are tasting differently and are softer. Uh, you know, I don't, you know, that's how to tune some of the traditional are of sockeye salmon. And I, I, I'm an, I kind of kind of guess what that could be. But, um, you know, of course, we have a lot of impact of uh, hatchery fish coming in. And who knows, it might be some of the plastics or the chemical changes of warmer water. I, I don't know, maybe those type of things you can address. But uh, yeah, so I guess I could go on quite a bit about salmon. But I do live in Whitehorse. And uh, yeah, welcome. Thanks for the, the talk. Thanks, Harlan. Um, I appreciate that. And I, I, I a brand new for me of some of your history with conservation officer services and some of your, your, uh, you'll have a lot of insights there as well. Um, yeah. And we miss I, you, Harlan. We miss you. <laughs> That's, That's what you said. You said. Okay. Well, I, I missed the job too, but uh, there was other things to do. Uh, I think I basically try to come on board to be more on your side, I guess, is kind of what, what I look at, right? <laughs> is, uh, YG has an interesting place, but uh, they're definitely um, there's, a, there's a long ways to go there before there, I guess, some reconciliation is on in the front burner with them, right? Well, it's great. It's great to know everyone's, I mean, it, I'm, I'm quite, I'm very honored actually to be in this group and I'm really glad we know your context because like, I mean, Brandy definitely runs the show and she's going to run this, this presentation, but uh, 
you know, we work well together because, you know, I think a large part, we work on caribou as well, but it's because largely because I'm, I'm not indigenous. I'm, you know, I'm from, I'm from the big city 20 plus years ago, but I, I, I seem to find myself in this place and I, I tend to take a, a Western science, more or less social science perspective. And Brandy and I sit at a lot of tables together where she brings in that very strong anchored uh, indigenous traditional knowledge perspective. And I think that's why we work so well together. So yeah, I'm pretty stoked to be doing this today. So I'm just gonna start the slideshow, Brandy, and then you wanna just- uh, Can nope. we just stop for one sec? I wanna like have Duncan tell his story. Oh, sorry, Duncan, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure, uh, uh, I think the, the most people might be aware I'm of, uh, you know, settler origin. Um, I, my day job is I, I work as the uh, urban planner and policy advisor to Kwanlin Dunn First Nation. Um, I also administer this course uh, on behalf of uh, the Yukon University. Um, yeah, but I've, I've had, a, you know, the pleasure of working very closely with Brandy. Um, Brandy, uh, you'll be happy to hear I've, I've uh, modeled some of the assignments in this class after uh, experiences that we've had uh, at Relaw and things like that. Um, but yeah, it's a, you know, it's a, a really interesting course for me to administer, to have such a, you know, breadth of knowledge and students in this class is fantastic. Uh, and I, you know, selfishly feel like I'm probably learning as much as uh, anybody else here. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very excited to listen into this lecture as well. And, and uh, you know, yeah, thanks for coming guys. Yeah. Hey Dennis, bring it up, take it away. And Duncan, you awesome. <laughs> All right. Um, and I didn't mention, Ran, I've, I lived in Anubik for five years. So that's my, that's my connection to the Western Arctic. Um, okay, so Brandy, take it away. Okay, so, so Southern Lake Salmon. When we talk about Southern Lake Salmon, we think of it um, like we look at an agenda. We, we speak holistically. Um, and then there's hemispheric and local, and then we can support how we can support salmon and our res restore, restore, restoration initiatives, and then our Southern Lakes uh, salmon plan. We have some other stuff that we can talk about, but we're going to focus on this because, or else we could talk salmon until like midnight. Yeah. But anyway, um, <laughs> yeah. So Southern Lake Salmon, um, we uh, work with uh, really closely with TKC or Tongan Quichin Council and Carcross Tagish First Nation. And then you know, so when we look at salmon, you know, this is a viewing chamber. Um, what most people in Whitehorse, um, how they resonate with salmon is going up there and like, if they even know that we have salmon in our rivers. So um, here's some, just some pictures of, you know, doing some jarring of salmon and we can keep going. Next slide. Who is this? This that's, is- uh, Den That's Dennis Allen oh, at, Dis at Lake LaBarge. Yeah, Dennis Smith. Dennis Smith, sorry, yeah. Yeah, Dennis Smith. And if you look at the size of this fish, this is the average now, which you can hold up with one hand. You give it, you know, even um, like 30, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, we got lots of pictures of um, salmon being twice that size and you would not be able to hold it with one hand like that. I don't care what size of muscles you have. Um, the salmon dynamics and the, the change in size is, is it really um, changed over the years. We haven't quite figured that out. This is a celebration of salmon um, hukusi out at Carcross Tagish First Nation. Um, it's about our ways, our, our traditional laws, our values. We're just gonna go through some pictures, just give you a little bit of context and then we'll go into the technical side of stuff. Next slide. Unless you wanna say something, Dennis. No, I don't. I just, my, son's, my son seems to wanna join us. So why don't you have a seat? Seriously. Have a seat. Oh, that's nice. Awesome. It's Zach. Zach, like, Zach was at Hakusti. Actually, cut a bunch of fish there. And uh, this is, uh, uh, as you know, um, this is Tucker River Clingit as well, right? So the Indian Clingit get together. And you can see here the, the salmon that they're, whoops, the salmon that they're, it was a beautiful ceremony, right? Um, where, you know, these nations got together and they, celebrated salmon and honored them. And that was a very beautiful thing. And we ate a ton of uh, taku salmon that day. So it was beautiful. Um, next slide. Yeah. Go ahead, Granny. Oh, wow. This, so this is Cheyenne Bradley. She, at this time, she was working with um, 
Was she EDI yeah, or DFO? EDI. I don't think she was with EDI. This is e DFO. So we collaborated with DFO and EDI on a incubation um, salmon project in the Ibex River. And this is collection of some salmon eggs getting ready to plant them. Um, behind there is Nick DeGraff with the hat. And then the other person is Don Hansen from EDI. And Cheyenne now works for us as a, a land steward officer, but she was hired through DFO on a, a work placement program with us. So building capacity, um, building up our, our, um, our youth to take over some of these salmon projects, which is really important. And DFO really got on board with this. Um, some of our neighboring consultants that do this work were really engaged with this, but this time. Anyway, this photo here uh, on the left is my my grandmother, Virginia Balavan, and next to her is my auntie Emily. She is, um, uh, and there. This is the size of the fish. Like, see what I said when you have to hold up a fish or a salmon at the time. This is out at Marsh Lake at our camp at uh, end of Swan Haven. Uh, right at the end of Swan Haven Road is a um, my family's um, property that they've. Um, inhibited for, well, my grandfather bought our, built our house there in 1900. And so salmon was part of our lives. And this, I think was taken in 1950. This is our cash or our drying racks, cash there. This is a photo taken in Pele to give you an idea of like how, you know, drying and stuff that they do, cutting it out. Anyway, um, this is some of the river panel discussions, a uh, photo from that. I'm not even sure who's standing up there. Who is that? Uh, I don't know, some, some Alaskan guy, I'm not sure. <laughs> I, think he's a, I think he's actually a international relations diplomatic guy, a federal government employee of the US. Okay, and I'll just give you a little context on the river panel if nobody knows. So part of the international treaty um, that we have with Alaska, or well, I guess it's US, Canada, um, Alaska Treaty. We have River Panel meetings uh, twice a year. There's a preseason and a postseason, and part of that is discussing. It's mostly, honestly, it is all about numbers. It's all about um, how many we can get for escapement. It's about um, presentations that have very little First Nations values in it, and it's we've been really fighting hard as Yukon First Nations and um, especially here at the Headwaters, um, how to include traditional knowledge in this process and in the management process. So um, we might go into that a little bit later, but anyway. Um, uh, this is this is a lot, like I sit on this panel and it's incredibly frustrating because we, we spend very little time actually talking about what I believe resonates with users of the fish and, and harvesters and those that are connected to it. So. We talk, it's, it's in my opinion, and I'm gonna be facetious when I say this, but it's the endless endless um, interest in, in filling all data gaps. So we're basically using science, chasing data, and yet there's very little political will to make any change and reduce harvest and things like that. So it's an incredibly, but it's a great example of a Western colonial process that dominates the, the, the entire um, species and the, and the management, the concept of management of that species is very interesting. And, and Granny's right, we are trying to address that, but it's slow and painful. Um, Granny, good. This, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, this, um. <laughs> this, uh, this is one of this is the best part of those meetings, though. The Alaskans always come with salmon, so they always bring all kinds of salmon, and that's the best part. So it's about the food, obviously, and then it's just about connecting. It's about connecting with the resource, right? And connecting with whether you call it a resource or connecting with salmon. Um, this is actually a Kwan Dunn fish camp. Um, and one of the few, which is one of the only ones at the time. Yeah, well, for for us, um, and somebody, uh, um, Brianne, thank you for reading some of that information ahead of time. But so for us, um, we have maybe on the off years, we'll have uh, maybe two nets in the water. Um, last year, sadly, we had to go out and ask our people to pull their nets 
because we didn't have the salmon to get through the ladder and to go to their spawning grounds. Um, so very little, very little people in our territory that are actually um, setting nets, traditional camps. Um, uh, we've done this for over 20 years that we have not been able to actually, you know, harvest salmon at the numbers that we ever had, or even, even, even close to it. We're, we're, we've been pulling back from that. So oh, oh. from that though, we lose a lot of, I'm sorry, my dog I'm, is, come here, say hi. <laughs> Sadness. <laughs> That's uh, my stepdaughter's dog. He's quite uh, aggressive when he's not getting paid attention to. <laughs> distracting me this is a real zoom life we go through anyway um yeah so not many of us fishing uh, we haven't for over 20 years um, from that we lose a lot of our um, connection with salmon and the traditions that go around that of sharing stories and um, passing on knowledge and connecting elders and youth so we we are really trying to get that that back and if it's through other avenues of just being able to, to celebrate salmon and know that we we still are salmon people that's where we go into this um so weaving salmon connections and i'll only let you take this one away sure yes. and i i'm gonna uh, i'm gonna give you an apology right up front brandy and i both have been very busy with a few other files lately and so we basically pulled together a number of different presentations so it's not a slick PowerPoint. We're not winning awards with this. I'll tell you that for free. But uh, we basically, this is from a workshop we did with actually the three, three First Nations, um, with citizens of Three First Nations. The point here is basically we look at them holistically because a lot of times you walk into these meetings and, and you know, if you're sitting particularly with a bunch of biologists, they're going to focus on sonar counts and genetics and escapement numbers and this kind of thing. But we look at it, you know, the, the concept of song, story, ceremony, language, that, that's of equal value in this. In this. Um, and so it's just important for us to always bring that to the table. And that's largely what we do. Um, so I don't know, do you want to just kind of bring it home from a very localized perspective, Brandy? So the Joe family, that's my, um, my family from Marsh Lake. And well, my great grandfather, Johnny Joe, he's actually originally from uh, um, Huchai, um, but which is in Champaign Asiatic territory. But traditionally, the man would come back to the woman's territory. But my, my grandfather's um, family, his mother's lineage came from Tagish as well. So um, anyway, I'll just, that's a little background here. So in 1978, interview Johnny and Julia Drew, who spent their lives hunting and fishing in the Upper Yukon watershed from their base at the north end of Marsh Lake, told writer McCandless, I don't know if you guys ever read any of his stuff. If you look it up, he's got a, a long history about um, the, the, this, the people on the river, uh, about changes to the, and apps of their traditional way of life. So basically, it wasn't just about salmon loss. It was about the, the dam that they built at the Lewis Marsh. And it was about taking away, he was a, uh, my grandpa was a, a trapper as well. So the muskrat went away. Um, <clears throat> and so basically what he said here, now they build dam, keep water high, clean out a big bunch of willow along the bank and the muskrat are all gone, Johnny said. Um, and then also, used to be big king salmon that come through here, used to be salmon camp near here and all Indians used to come here to dry salmon for winter. We had two big long traps. One time we got 50 salmon in one night. It was like cluck shoe. He's quoted in McKenna's book. So um, anyway, you can see from this, like the stories that this was told at this time that how much it's changed. Like 50 salmon in one night. We're lucky, you know, we had 200 and 16 fish come through the fish ladder this year. And this is just 50 salmon in one night and they would have their fish camps out there for 10 days. And some of the people along the river would catch up to 500 to 1,000 fish a night and dry them. And they would have fish for the whole winter to survive. And plenty went to spawn and they would come back year after year. So you could see how it changed with these dams. and the impacts that they had 
on our people's way of life, not only just from food sources, but from their economic um, uh, money making, their source of money. They would have muskrat to trade. They would, it, it changed everybody's way of life. And then, you know, pretty much now he lives on, at this time, they had to rely on the government to supply them with um, uh, uh, money and food sources. So taken away, it, it's a, this is the sadder side of the thing, but at the same time, we'd like to think we're gonna, we're gonna build this up. Don't get sad. <laughs> Yeah, we, um, so it's what's interesting is when you introduced yourself, you know, I think there was a real connection to fish or caribou or this type of thing. And, and what, what, what's so amazing is, as you, you know, and for, I'm sure you all know, there's a big dam at Whitehorse and there's a fish ladder that the fish have to navigate around. And I mean, it essentially cut off, especially like the Carcross Tagish people from their salmon. And they don't see themselves as salmon people. I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to speak in their voice or any way. But they're, you know, they definitely see themselves as caribou people, but salmon. So part of what we're trying to do is reorient to, to that people see themselves as salmon people again. And, you know, that for Taltan and Tucker to Klingit, for example, that would be crazy, right? You are salmon people. Um, so it's very interesting to kind of, that's, that's sort of a bit of the sidebar. But just to kind of, so we've, we've gone, we've, you know, we've kind of shared some of the context We've come, you know, um, Brandy shared with you some of her family, down to her family fish camp stories. And I'm gonna kind of pull, pull, pull it out again. I guess before we go there, are there any questions from anyone or any, any comments or anything anyone wants to add at this point? Or any stories that you wanna share? Yeah. Oops. I'm like, Shirley, do you, have you seen any of this, like besides what you said in your introduction, have you seen any of this similarity, like something like this happen, impacts from, you know, maybe development or, or impacts in your territory that might be impacting the salmon runs and how it impacts your people? Yeah, I'm, I'm not too sure like what the cause is. I, I haven't been in the loop on that part. And I think like people in our fisheries department and lands are like working with DFO and other people like to figure that out. But like the numbers like you mentioned for you guys, like we don't get nearly as much food fish as we used to. And like, I think this year we're not even allowed to have food fish. And um, in my intro, I mentioned like, we have a, a few salmon fish camps and that was my first time at a weir. And um, I was looking at old data and over the last 20 years, like 20 years ago, it was in the thousands. And then in the last decade, like maybe maximum five, 600 fish. Like last year there, there was 600 fish salmon that came up and I don't know what happened, but then we had a big jump to just under 6,000 salmon come up and our nation is working like down some of the rivers, like restructuring um, rocks and stuff. Like there's some waterfalls that they have to jump up and all of that. And they were thinking that was making it more difficult for the salmon to come up to some of the weirs. So that may have helped. And so like they blast rocks out of the way and stuff like that. And, but like, yeah, it's just talk around our community is that the salmon, it's, it's just not the same as it used to be. And um, we have um, commercial fishermen. We have a certain amount of licenses that are given out to fishermen in our community and they fish on the Taku river, but they're also like I guess competing with with the states down down near Juneau and and they're they're fishing like crazy amounts of fish and so I don't know when the line will be drawn to say when they when they sh when they should stop s fishing so much salmon but the numbers have definitely declined a lot and as a result of that we're we're not allowed food fish and you know that's part of our way of life and so it's it's really sad. Yeah. That's very interesting. How about you, Harlan? What do 
uh, what, what's like you guys are a sound people and I don't know if you go back for fish camp every year. I mean, COVID probably didn't help, but do you, have you gone back to fish camp every year or do you just, um, I have been almost every year, but of course last year that, that didn't happen. And the, we're basically, it was best to stay away from, you know, bringing potential illness into the community. So uh, pretty much uh, everybody stayed away last year. However, the, the runs for the last, I will say 10 years, uh, are drastically being reduced on sockeye and especially the kings or chinook, whatever you want to call them. Um, but I, I think uh, so. A lot of us have reduced our fishing, uh, food fishery, but uh, we're we're kind of a slightly we take a slightly different approach when it comes to conservation. Uh, the runs have been somewhat healthy down there, but of course they're coming down. And however, it's pretty hard to tell uh, the Taltan people don't fish. They'll pretty much go fish and not really listen to anybody. So we do have a, a bit of a slightly disconnect from listening to our people who are working in, in hand in hand with the International Treaty and the Fisheries Canada. Um, might have to be my couple of nephews do work down the border and they, they work on the river all the time. Uh, and so. But I guess my my question to you is that, um, in terms of uh, I, how do you guys come to a decision that whether you're going to fish or not is that kind of a, a community decision or is that more of an international decision? And I, I know it's probably hard to tell your community not to fish because you do want to keep that connection going. But uh, at the same time, you know, uh, who makes that decision? Is that from your office or is that from fisheries? Because I, I know it's different here, and I, I don't know how the the chapter sixteen does is it, is it part of does it is it a big part of the salmon? I guess is my question. Yeah, well, uh, I can answer that. Well, chapter sixteen in our final agreements gives the the there's recommendations that come through the Yukon Salmon Subcommittee or YSSSC. You guys can hear it like that most often, and the recommend recommendations are okay maybe consider not fishing but then they actually then they'll recommend to close the fisheries um we would like quillen dunn likes to take the on the initiative before it happens uh we try to rely on this but i mean we're at the headwaters we're the last we're the end of it so by the time the salmon got get here they've been already fished so the, for instance, last year, um, the numbers of escapement were predicted to be higher. So when they, there's pilot station, which is kind of at the mouth of the, uh, the Yukon River with the Bering Sea. And they, they said, oh, we're predicting like 181,000. It's going to be 72,000. And escapement is going to be at least meet the maximum, which is about 55,000 and giving an average. Um, but then they hit the next owner and Eagle and it was like 33,000. Um, but they let them go through. And so during COVID, we knew that people were gonna be fishing. We knew this, but the information got out slowly. So of course um, the upper river or the lower river in Yukon were fishing and taking quite a few fish when we should have just said no. And we should have, closed it sooner. By the time they got here, we had a couple nets in the water between us and Ta'an, very few fish. Like I, I believe that one um, had 13 fish and the other had 30. I mean, when we're looking at the numbers that are crowing across the, the ladder that they're 200, that's a lot, but it really isn't. The fishery should have been closed as soon as we knew it was 33,000 and said, nobody fish, nobody go through. But between Pilot Station, which is at the border, and Eagle, somewhere in there, and Dennis, quote me if I'm wrong, we lost somewhere 40,000 fish disappeared. Um, even though there was the Americans that had taken really conserv conservative uh, approaches to the fishery, like a lot of them didn't fish, they closed the fisheries, they had like small openings, um, but somehow, some way we lost uh, 40,000 fish. This is something we're bringing up with the, on the river panel discussions, how that happened. Like, I mean, if, if you lost $40,000 and it just disappeared, you'd be looking, but we lose 40,000 fish and they're just kind of like, eh, we lost 40,000 fish. Well, we're going, there's 40,000 
salmon, Chinook salmon missing. Where are they? And that's been the last, that's been kind of the trend in this. Uh, I don't know if you look at it between Dennis, help me out here from pilot. If you can show pilot where pilot is. Pilot's here. Yeah. And then going through Eagle. Um, and then very small openings for fisheries um, and and the reported numbers, some like Tanana, for instance, didn't even fish for Chinook. So I these are there's some really complicated questions in here or complicated um, issues, and we're trying to figure this out. And we've brought this to the attention of the river panel. Um, and chapter 16 is we have the right to shut down our own fisheries. Why SSC can take our recommendations. They'll give us a recommendation to shut it down. It's really up to us in chapter 16 to actually um, say yay or nay. Uh, Last year was the first year that we shut it down. Like we actually went out and asked our people and Ton, I went out with Ton in a, a collaborative effort to shut down anybody who had their nets in the water within our traditional territory. Um, that's heartbreaking, it's heartbreaking. So what's, what's interesting, and we, we could spend hours talking about the management because it's pretty pretty interesting, but I guess just kind of a, a few things. So Brandy mentioned, you know, I mean, at, at the end of the run, you're gonna feel it, right? And it's no different. Every, every salmon that comes to Yukon has to pass through Alaska, whether that's on the transboundary or it's through um, the LSEC or it's through the Yukon River or whatnot. Um, so we're at their mercy, right? We really are. And it's two different systems. They've got, they've got different, as you know, as you may know, to be a subsistence fisher in Yukon, you're a First Nation, right? And, and in BC, I would imagine, I don't think, I'm, actually I'm not, I shouldn't speak to BC, but in Alaska, you just have to live in, in the, you have to live in the Yukon, in Alaska for a year. So Germans that come off the plane can have a cabin and have the same subsistence rights as uh, tribal Tenana or Inupiat or whatnot. So it's a whole different thing, but I guess just to kind of highlight the, the, the so a couple of the pieces that Brandy mentioned. So pilot station is they have an assessment project. This is this is over a mile wide. So it's basically an estimate, right? So the fish come in, they're out here, they come in, they come in here. There's 50 plus communities along this entire drainage that depend on those fish. They divide into regions, one, two, three, four, five, five, A, B, C, D, all that stuff. Um, the fish come here, they make an assessment, they go, yep, okay, we're, we're looking like we got a good run or a bad run. Sorry, it keeps jumping around here. Anyways, that's an estimate. And then the problem is when they actually find out where, what they actually materialize is at the border, it's often too late because everyone here's had a crack at them. So it's, it's very challenging. And Alaskan subsistence law, as you know from the Taku and different places like that, it's built on subsistence rights. Those are, that comes first. In Canada, it's conservation first. So to answer your question as well, um, to what's interesting, you asked about local management. DFO politically will never tell a First Nation what to do anymore. The First Nations can request, um, you know, can request a closure. If, if they're not gonna meet a statement, DFO can, can, can enforce and shut down a fishery but they don't do it that way. What they do is they issue, and you'll appreciate this uh, from, a, from a conservation perspective, conservation officer perspective, DFO issues a communal fishing license. That's all they do. So they give, they give Trondek, uh, uh, you know, Ta'an, Kwanlin Dunn, they issue them a communal fishing license. But what they do is if the run's really bad, they'll still issue them a communal fishing license, but they'll, they'll have a limit of zero. They'll actually say zero. So they just, they get around it, right? By not restricting harvesting rights, but say we, and it's, it's generally, a, um, what they'll typically do is say, we recommend you harvest 25% of what you normally harvest. They'll say things like that. They don't want to get into that, but what's, it gets like another level and I'll get into this and then we'll move faster because we're going to be here forever. Um, is, uh, you know, Brandy mentioned, I mean, the Southern Lakes First Nations being at the end of the run are incredibly conservation oriented. Um, you know, Northern Shoshone communities, they're, they're act, they have an active fishing culture. And what's interesting is, you know, in the, what I've heard is that that sometimes involves some shaming and they don't want to participate because they feel like people are against harvest. So it creates these interesting dynamics within Yukon First Nations. So we're, we're finding that, and, and people don't want that, right? We don't want to be shaming for, for doing something that your people have always done. So it's very complex, but I'm going to get into this here in the next one a little bit. Um, 
So this was basically just an attempt to demonstrate, you know, it's one of many charts demonstrate a declining pattern, right? This is Chinook salmon. So Chinook are the big ones, obviously. Um, Brandy mentioned we've lost the larger fish. Uh, so we used to have even eight-year-olds. We used to have eight-year-old Chinook. They were big, 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 big fish. Big, fat, juicy Chinook. Lots of fat. When they hang a Chinook that comes to Canada and they hang a Chinook that goes into Alaska at the mouth of the river, they, they always know the Canadian ones because they drip fat. They're just, there's a pile of fat. They have to watch their smoke when they smoke them because they can have fire because there's so much fat in these Canadian fish because they need so much energy to go 3,000 kilometers. So we've seen a decline here. Um, it's a large decline. Um, this one is from uh, Nick and it's the white horse. So this is now we're getting into Brandy's traditional territory. And this are the white horse fish ladder stocks. So you can see we're down to a small, I mean, they go up and down, but we're down to quite a small amount. So that's the narrative. And this is just to sort of a, a reminder for us to talk and Brandy already mentioned it. We, the, the, the management structures talk about number of fish. It's purely a mathematical, as, as Brandy mentions, all numbers. What, what they don't factor in is size of fish, sex ratios, um, which are really important, and genetics, right? It's just how many pieces of fish can we get across? That's how they actually refer to them in Alaska in the, on the management tables. So what this is, this is demonstrating, A, we've got a lot of pre-spawn mortality, which is kind of a sidebar. There's a lot of fish, there's a lot of females now that are dying with eggs in their bellies because of a variety of things, because they can't find suitable habitat, weather's warming, they can't make the journey because it's too tired, et cetera. But they're also smaller, they're younger, um, and, and that's a real issue because bigger fish have bigger eggs, have more eggs, and it's a better uh, quality of escapement indicator. You're gonna get more productivity from your fish and everything's going smaller. And so then you make a net size change where you go from an eight inch mesh to, to get to get the next one and you just end up fishing down those year classes. Anyway, I'm getting kind of nerdy on that. What I wanted to do here was just, I don't want to belabor this. This is something that I nerd out on. I love this stuff. It's all scale. And I apologize. This was a presentation I was doing. I was actually doing a PhD in this. It didn't last very long, uh, but I still, I did a presentation and this was, this was my, my slide. But what I wanted to demonstrate was you know, Shirley mentioned Juno, and you know, we've talked about Alaska, and there's in the Bering Sea, they're competing with hatchery chum from Japan, Russia, China. So they're all mixing. So what I want to kind of just bring to your attention is kind of this hemispheric scale of, of, of um, management, right? So I was part of a group called the International Year of the Salmon. It's the North Pacific Anadromous Fish Commission. And we were looking at it hemispherically. So we were looking at Russia, Korea. Uh, uh, US, Canada, Japan, uh, maybe Thailand, I can't remember, one more. Whoops. Anyways, my point is there's an international scale of this. So we talk about Brandy's fish at the end of the run, you know, from a local, local Kuala Dun government, um, you know, it, it, there's implications at a very hemispheric level. So we go from hemispheric, then we go to national, and well, we're international, sorry, that's the Alaska Yukon. We go to national, Alaska has their own management structure, uh, Yukon has their own management structure. Then we get to a provincial, Yukon, whatever. Then we get to village community. Um, so all of this is part of a socio-ecological system, which is that holistic approach. But I guess what I wanted to point out here was I went to some meetings in Oregon and the Pacific Salmon Treaty that both Taltan and uh, Takamon River Klingit are part of, which is different than our treaty on the Yukon River side. This is what it looks like. Do these people look like they fish? I don't think so. These are not fishers. These are the people that are making decisions. They're bureaucrats. They wear ties. They have translation. This is, this is what happens at the international level. And, and, and so this is, I mean, you take someone like Brandy, who just shared her story about her, her grandmothers and aunties and their fish camps since 1900. This is what's happening at the scale. This is the structures in place. Obviously, I'm biased. This is a, this is a kid from Old Crow who's got some chum salmon, a guichin youth who's puts up a lot of salmon for dog food in the summer or in the winter for their dogs and you know look at the difference right and so one of the work I was trying to do was sort of looking at scale scales networks paths and different things like that but I kind of wanted to go um, this is some of the literature but when you go large scale conservation when you're talking about international it hides local values um, 
So you need, yeah, I get kind of nerdy here. This is like my old P. I just dumped this in. It's my old PhD stuff. But um, I wanted to get to one. Anyways, my point is that, okay, this is the one I wanted to highlight. If the geographical scale does not match, things may become more technical, resulting in increasingly more distance from the realities of fishing communities. So I'm just highlighting that, you know, that, that the fact that Brandy's family fish camp for many generations is being impacted by political colonial structures that are happening at international scale. Did you want to say something, Shirley? I'm good. I'm just like agreeing with everything you're saying. Right, cool, cool. <laughs> good. Well, I'm going to stop there. That's my kind of nerdy uh, scale stuff, which I just love. Um, and and I'll, I'll give you one more example and I'll bring it home to Duncan and Brandy because we're talking about this and I get fired up about this. So the White Horse Dam, right? You got a White Horse Dam. You know, it's hydro. There's some really good things about hydro. You got a fish ladder. You know, it, it did cut people off. They basically stopped the river for a while. Fish were bumping their heads against the wall. You know, that's not really a traditional value or respectful. Regardless, they got a fish ladder. So if you look at the local scale, but the implications of that river are all the way down. They go all the way down through to Alaska. They go down to the end. Like it's, it's, if, it's, if we're looking at it holistic and everything's connected, that we have to we have to start having bigger picture discussions and not just look at things in very small minute ways. All right, Brandy, you're on. So now we're on the how can we support salmon section. Okay, I just want to go back and see if anybody has any um, comments to that. Actually, not even questions, just comments. What it, what's your what do you guys have to say about that? Because that's um, I mean, that impacts like you, Shirley, you, Harlan, and maybe it's not salmon in your, in your traditional territory, Rianne, but I mean, you guys probably have the same impacts to your whitefish, your uh, freshwater fish. That's huge. You guys, caribou. yeah, yeah, and caribou. Yeah. Anyway, I'll, 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 uh, Harlan, how about we start with you? Oh, okay. Um, I would just, uh, for some reason I had a question in my head before I before I go forward but and I, I it might be for Dennis I, I I noticed that down in Taltan and Stikeen River that we're catching a lot of jacks right and uh, and I, I didn't quite right I know it, it doesn't seem right and is that all part of this changing of, of the, the fish don't seem to be doing what they're supposed to be doing anymore like yeah do, do, we're... Do, you have, do you have an answer for that yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing anecdotally, I, Brandy can confirm this as well. I know in Tesla, they're talking about a lot of jacks. Um, and actually, they have these, um, what do they call those ones? The micro jacks. That's what they're called. They got micro jacks now that actually don't leave. They stay in oh, the fresh. Right. Yeah, it's crazy. So you've got a salmon species that doesn't actually, doesn't become an adermis. It doesn't leave. Um, yeah, it is all part of it. And we've seen that. Um, it's basically the year classes, right? So a jack is a small, is a younger uh, salmon that will come back early. It's actually an evolutionary, they play a role because they, they, they actually come out of the year class. So they, they end up uh, supporting the genetic mix throughout year classes because they come back early. So if you lose a whole group for a landslide, like that's happened, um, you get that genetics in, with the young ones. Um, and they also, they'll, but they'll sneak in there and they'll, they'll fertilize an, a red when the big males are jostling for position. So. Um, but yeah, I think that's all part of the whole mix of climate change and warming temperatures and things are just out of whack. Fish are coming back early. They're triggered earlier. Look at the ones in the Mackenzie River, like that go by Sigachik that they're catching in nets, the Pacific salmon. It's, it's all part of that mix, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's interesting. Um, yeah, we've, we, we have done some work with the, um, a researcher for the wildlife or Canadian Wildlife Federation, and they had caught a couple of jacks, and we're seeing it more and more. It's not just here; it's like close. To, if it's, anybody's gone to Haines, Alaska to go fishing, I have gone there every year up until COVID, and I have been catching jacks uh, probably every time out of six or seven fish I would catch a day. I'd probably catch two. That's that's amazing. That's huge. I don't remember ever remember that back in the days, but that's it's just something that's happening. I think it's, 
other trapping or like getting trapped in or just coming back or sneaking in or climate change or whatever. We don't know exactly what it is, but it's interesting stuff. Um, anyway, um, can we just take a, a Duncan, how do you guys, it, does anybody else have any more questions? Look at me being the facilitator here because I just did this all day today because um, I have to go to the washroom. <laughs> Yeah, we, we can take, take a break. Uh, if everybody wants to take a five minute break and uh, maybe reconvene at 630. Does that sound good? Perfect. All right. Six minutes. Six minutes. All right. See you then. We are back. Is everybody else noticing how beautiful it is outside? <laughs> it's gorgeous out there. <laughs> it is so gorgeous. We should be yeah. conducting this outside. You almost see the suntan. I, I hope to visit it one day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, me, me too. I, I snuck in a ski. Um, oh, nice. <laughs> so Brandy, we should probably try and uh, I think we, we can probably wrap it up in about 15. I'm thinking. Yeah. Okay, so I just wanted to, is everybody back? Okay, so I just wanted to like to highlight some of the, the stuff that we are doing at Quinlan Dunn. 
So if you want to just skip this, go back to here. So we have um, three projects on the go with um, incubation, in-stream incubation projects. We started in 2019 as a test trial in the Ibex River in-stream incubation trial. So what it is, is we are um, uh, taking eggs from females. We, we took one female and two males to um, plant these eggs. We got the, the eggs from one female and we planted them into the stream. And it's about um, just seeing of timing and how they would develop in, in, in a natural environment and trying these restoration projects to rebuild um, salmon stocks in these um, historically uh, migrating areas for salmon. So um, there you go, it's right there. I'm just gonna really skip through this. You guys can ask me questions afterwards. We can always share this per with you too. So right there is some um, little samoids that are coming to life, going into the salmon stage. Um, slow rate of development in colder water. And some of this information will feed into the larger um, uh, tributary uh, and, and, and the main stem. So we're working with Teslin. They have the Dead Man Creek and they have Morley River, and then Trondek has the Klondike River, and we are doing the Ibex. In 2020, we added Wolf Creek and Michi Creek. And if anybody knows, Michi Creek um, is at the headwaters of the of Michi Lake, which is the longest spawning uh, migration for Chinook salmon um, that we have within our traditional territory. The longest spawning grounds is been known to be in um, Teslin in the, um, the Sutland. But for us, it's still about a 3000 kilometer journey for these salmon to get there. So we are looking at doing incubation there too, because we our numbers have drastically dropped and there's Mitchy Creek right there. See the large cobble. And it's amazing. I just want to give you guys a little, um, like these guys have um, migrated 3000 kilometers, approximately 3000 kilometers. And when they get there, Chinook salmon need large cobble or they go for larger cobble to move. So there's some studies that we're thinking about doing in the future is about now that they're smaller size and they can't move that bigger cobble that they might be migrating to smaller cobble to build their reds. Um, anyway, so this is Mitchie uh, in-stream incubation uh, project. We planted, we, the eggs that we got from, for the Michi Creek project were actually from the fisheries or from the hatchery because they, they have that mitigation. Um, it's a mitigation program that was built so that we can feed the upper stream. It's, as we know, we don't, the hatchery, the hatcheries don't work. And we're starting to see that now. Um, I, don't, I don't want to go way back, but you can see that the with the graph, when we feed this to you, that there's more wild salmon that are getting through than there is a hatchery. So um, there's been some genetic studies on that, and there's going to be some more work on that to see why that is happening. Um, but um, other fisheries have proven that hatcheries don't work. So we're trying to do incubation projects to see if um, when salmon are born in their own natural habitat that they have a better chance and better survival and um, uh, um, anyway so yeah anyway uh, you're, you're going through these things so fast that I can't con concentrate but anyway um, this is one of the, the three of the projects that we're doing with in-stream incubation that'll uh, tie into the bigger picture with other um, programs that are going on on the Yukon River system. Anyway, um, we can just move on from this, thanks. Um, if you guys, last year, um, we didn't count any reds in the Michi Creek or McClintock um, uh, systems that we, we didn't count any reds. So we were like, well, no reds, no, no, no returning Chinook. So we'll, we'll see that in six years. And this year we had uh, a small count of five on Mitch Creek and a couple on McClintock, which is, is, um, a good, but not, not near anything that we, we would expect in, 
and this has only happened the last couple of years before we were counting like at least 20 to 30 to 40. And, and our numbers have dropped drastically in the last couple of years. And we don't know if that's climate change, something going on the stream. There's been some studies going on on the, um, the ladder that they're, the salmon are going up and turning back. And um, it's disheartening, but um, a lot of the research that we're doing will feed into that. And I know it's not um, traditionally um, how we would do things, but sometimes we need to use science to feed into the system of how we um, manage salmon within our TT. When I say TT, traditional territory. Um, this year, we we put in a, um, a couple a couple of fun well three funding proposals to continue the Wolf Creek, Mitchy, and Ibex incubation stuff. But we're also looking at putting the sonar into the Dakini River system, and eventually see how that will tie into the Yukon main stem. So. Yeah, that's some of the just some of the restoration projects that we have going on, and now we're going to go into um, our holistic plan. It's called the What Is a Salmon Plan, and this is our, our social uh, plan. And I'm going to let Dennis take this part away. Sure, thanks, Brandy. Um, so yeah, so you know, a couple of ways that we can support salmon. Um, is through restoration efforts. And then of course, we're developing these salmon plans. And, and what are these salmon plans? When you say a salmon plan, what is it? A lot of people think they're technical. Um, you know, they give you a variety of all this data and whatnot, but what these are, these are foundational values-based plans that really connect and, uh, you know, bring people together around salmon. So um, I've been fortunate to work with a number of First Nations on them, Wundagwichin, Selkirk, Teslin, Atrondek, and um, they're all different. Every, every First Nation uh, government has a, a different approach and uh, this one is completely unique. And essentially what it is, is it's a foundational document that speaks to values, priorities and principles and their connection. Uh, it's a source of pride and strength. It's done in your way and your plan. It has a connection to other projects, et cetera. So, you know, Harlan mentioned how do the local, you know, how do things, how do communities manage their salmon? And uh, I can only speak for, say, Selkirk, or, say, Selkirk First Nation of Pelly Crossing. They have quite an active fishing culture, and they have what's called Fish Camp Doli, where it's their traditional law, and that's how they manage salmon. So they basically, um, you know, have their rules that you have at fish camp, and it, and it, and it, and it, they went as, they went so far as to say, if you catch lots of females, then you release, start releasing females, you pull your nets, um, you every, every fish camp. Um, you know, needs 20 fish to be a viable fish camp in terms of setting it up and that type of thing. So they go up and down from that. If it's a really bad run, they'll go down from 20. If they, if it's a good run, they'll go up from 20. So those are guidelines. Um, and those are based on their traditional ways and, and some practical realities. Um, what it's not, it does not sit in isolation and just focus on Western science. It doesn't focus on managing people and salmon through existing processes, it does not focus on harvest and and not what, on what crosses the border. Uh, it doesn't fit anyone else's organization's boxes, checklists, or process. It's not top down, and it's not a, not a silver bullet that will bring back salmon. So these are kind of the things it's not. And why is it different? Because it's it's their plan, right? This is Brandy's plan. I mean, you heard her connection, family connection to the river. It's done in your way, and it focuses on your priorities. Um, and this is what uh, DFO, when they issue a communal fishing license, they'll refer to these community-based salmon plans. And, you know, there will be, we will, this plan will address harvest, but maybe not in terms of numbers. It might address it in a different way. Um, and the one thing about this plan that's really important, and it's part of the Kwanlin Dunn, I mean, if you're familiar with the Kwanlin Dunn, um, you know, I guess history as Duncan and Brandy are, are, are intimately familiar, um, you know, there were a lot of impacts, whether it's the dam, the Alaska Highway, the Gold Rush, residential schools, you name it. And this story needs to be told because that connection, this, the plan is actually proposed to be um, reconnecting the broken or repairing the broken salmon trail because the trail was broken. Um, and so it's about reconnection. Um, I won't read these, but there's a whole narrative around, um, you know, salmon and living on the river and, and the way things used to be. So this is really important, whether it's through art, ceremony, stuff. I mean, I'm sure you're all familiar with the Salmon Boy story. 
um, you know, the boy who disrespected salmon and there's the, the crow, you know, here's one, for example, Raven brought salmon so he could have food. He dropped an egg at the head of every creek. The salmon return every year when Creek Mother sings her song. So, you know, there's just so much written in this, right? Um, and then, um, you know, all kinds of quotes. And, and how will we know we have succeeded when we have cultural connections to salmon, social structures, the knowledge has been transferred. There are salmon connections to ancestors. Salmon are being harvested or not, as Brandy mentioned, and there is a fish camp culture, whether maybe it's a ceremonial harvest. And I will quick segue into the Taku salmon because the Yukon First Nations have relied on Taku salmon now for a number of years to purchase and fly in. And so, you know, there's an intimate connection with those Taku salmon. So that's, that's, that it's scary to think that those salmon are not doing well as, now as well. Uh, people eat salmon are benefiting health from a health and wellness perspective, basic needs, food sovereignty, healthy ecosystem, bears, birds, fish and insects. Uh, salmon are observed on the territory, citizens are sharing them, people are salmon stewards and salmon bring uh, organizations together. So we're wrapping up two years and I mean to be honest with you, we, we, uh, we're, we're actually writing the plan right now. Um, we've got a draft out and there's all kinds of aspects of it, but you know, a lot of it involves meetings and um, newsletters and workshops and all kinds of things. And we're actually working with a landscape artist that's helping um, present it visually. And Brandy's had a big part of this in terms of um, looking at oral and written history, or, um, written systems, knowledge systems, and how those all trickle down. And uh, Brandy, do you want to maybe explain just like at a high level your your oceans to glaciers type traditional law discussion? Okay, so without looking at it, I'm going to go off the top of my head. But um, uh, so part of this plan was in, in in every plan that I work on is looking at um, two different knowledge systems or, or different models. Um, so you got your oral um, knowledge and then you have your written knowledge. For um, far back in time immemorial, how we, um, we, we had a, a, a governance system, I guess, as compared to what the traditional or the scientific side of it is today. And it's written down. We just talked about it was orally. Our elders passed down their stories. Um, we had a sense of governance we had language, we had all this. So if you put it on that, if you want to have equal weight with that model as compared to the scientific model or the written model, we would say under oral knowledge, written knowledge, we would have traditional knowledge. And then if you compare it to the other side, we would have Western science. If you looked, I'm going to give you a, just give you a really quick, quick briefing of this is like, uh, language everybody's like how does language um, come into um, a knowledge system well language well we we always knew when we pass another border or into somebody else's traditional territory is by language and if you compare it to the written side of it is like jurisdiction or border um, implementation was through our youth all those stories were told and teachings were uh, brought and kept carrying on was through um, our youth. And if you look at the, the written side of it is through implementation. Um, there is also, you look at traditional law versus conservation. Um, anyway, so those are just kind of some ideas that we're using here and how we look at this, this plan and how we can bring both knowledge systems or models with equal weight and, and instead of like having them be, um, what happens is like, we always try to like, how do we bridge these? How do we bridge these? And, and how do we make them um, be part of this system and have equal weight? Well, what happens is that everybody tries to merge them all the time when they shouldn't be merged. And really what it is, is there are two different knowledge systems, but yet you can come together with a, um, um, bring in that knowledge system and the oral knowledge system, sorry, the, the Western system and the, and the um, 
oral system into it and bridging them together with what are the commonalities out of it? What do you want to come out of it? You want to, you want to come up with, depending on what your plan is for us, it's like, we want to have, um, uh, collaboration. We want to have salmon, um, be the forefront of the conversation. We know that all these systems play into this. And if you keep trying to bridge them together all the time when they shouldn't be bridged together, you come up with what I call is cultural confusion. And every that seems to be one of the, um, the toughest and how how people bring that together and trying to share those two knowledge systems together it causes this culture confusion that you can't do so you need to like separate them but bring them together for the same and out, same outcome and the same um uh what is your outcome what do you guys want from that from the science side of it and same from the oral side of it so or the traditional side of it um i'm I, without looking at it in front of me, I can't explain it that well. But anyway, um, uh, one day I can bring back that when we finalize it. I'm right in the middle of developing this where it's actually being drafted into a illustrative model that comes with all the explanations behind it. But anyway, it's it's just a, two different knowledge systems. And, and, and we think about that and we bring it into how we plan and how we do everything. We we can collaborate and, and come up with a, a good outcome that brings both knowledge systems into, in, into play. Anyway, I've been at Zoom says eight o'clock this morning, you guys, I'm tired. <laughs> yeah, I think we're all tired. Well, that's yeah. the end of our presentation. So um, we kind of took you on a whirlwind tour of probably large parts of our brain. But uh, yeah, I, you know, I hope that hit the mark and we covered a lot of ground. So any, any questions? Um, I just want to let you guys know that salmon can stories and topics that we didn't even touch with our like First Nations collaboration and our stuff with Alaska. There's so much involved with this that it's um, it. Well, the river panel takes seven days to, to do. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> I think I've heard uh, Brandy talk about salmon a number of times. Well, I, I know I have. Uh, and it's amazing to me that every time it's completely new information and there's no overlap. Uh, yeah, you can, I mean, you could teach a course on it, uh, just that, I'm, I have no doubt. It's incredibly complex. Yeah, uh, are there, yeah, are there any questions uh, for Dennis or Brandy? Um, I guess that's Harlan here. I, I do have a question about the Yukon River panel. Now, does the Yukon River panel have representation from all the Yukon First Nations that are along the Yukon River or is that uh, uh, or is there a lot of participants or is it just a few major players at a high level? Yeah I can I can um, jump on that so the representation is actually stipulated in the um, in the chapter 16 so it's basically the salmon subcommittee so the salmon subcommittee uh, makes up the majority of the Yukon River panel. That's the way it's written. Um, and then you have, beyond that, I'm not sure, like the terms of reference from the treaty itself, there's, I think there's a bit of gray, but basically it's there's seven members, four of which are gonna be Yukon, for, are gonna be Yukon salmon subcommittee members. The Yukon salmon subcommittee members are made up of uh, porcupine, uh, which is the old crow Gwich'in uh, drainage, the ALSEC, which is the champagne Ajac, right? And then the Yukon River drainage, the C CYFN nomination. And then you have a Governor of Canada representative and a Governor of Yukon, uh, no, uh, Fish and Wildlife Management Board. Anyways, so that has been a source of, your, you're, picking into, you're picking into a good area, Brandy knows, um, that, that representation has been a challenge uh, because the First Nations don't believe they've been adequately represented at that table. They don't have representation from Northern Toshone or like there's nothing like that. Um, so it's it's stipulated in chapter 16 that it makes a majority, but the reps, they do try to bring in a porcupine and ALSEC and a quite often. Um, and I've sat on it actually from Governor of Yukon perspective as a as a I was I was actually 
the basically the licensed public angler, recreational angler seat. So there's a bit of funny gray business in there, um, but typically it gets chaired by uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, the usually the uh, area director and ADF Alaska Department of Fish and Game. But that's something actually as of like a few, even a few weeks ago, I was asking like, where is that? Who says that has to happen? So there's a bit of funny business there with that stuff. But um, yeah, does that answer your question? Uh, dear okay, respective okay. chair, dear respective chair, chair, co-chair, co-chair is like, it's such a colonized system. It's so it's against painful. our values. It's a cult, I'm not gonna lie to you. It's like, it is the most frustrating process that I've ever been involved with in any working group that I've been involved with and any group that I've been involved with. We, we as First Nations have the opportunity to do testimony that they don't actually document and address. They listen to it, but if it's been addressed, it hasn't been. Last year, they brought in the um, First Nations advisory for each First Nation that you can sit basically behind. You get a a chance to talk and ask some questions at that point, but not necessarily, I, actually, we don't even know what their role is. They haven't defined it. It's just that we've included a First Nation advisory. What that means, <laughs> there hasn't been any clarification behind that, um, not really, anyway. And um, cool. the system is flawed. It's very flawed. The management system is flawed and, and how First Nations in the Yukon are involved or even along the whole Alaska, on the Alaska side as well as Yukon River is very flawed. We don't have um, much of a say and it's based on a technical working group. What the heck they call the joint technical working group. Uh, they make all the decisions based on pretty much numbers and the um, rest of the system is based on our testimony. So from there, as, as First Nations or our users of the river or people that have lived along there for millennia have starting to work in together. All of us have started to come together and work with Alaska with the people that are actually living on Out, the river. Outside the, of that process. The different tribes. We're working on a, um, a summit. Last year was the first one that we had. What Before COVID, we had it um, in November. Before the, um, the post uh, river panel session in 2019. That's the last time we got we got together. We were start, starting to think about this, like how are we gonna do our 20s or 2020? No, it was 19, yeah. Anyway, um, we met with Alaska. We brought chiefs and users and we just let them know they were like talking about their, oh, we set so many fishnets and we did this and, and then they asked us and we're like, well, we haven't had a fishnet in the, in the river in years. They were shocked, shocked. So just bringing that small group of people together really opened up the eyes and the conversation and everybody to bring together, like we need to work together. If we're gonna be able to have a salmon running up this river for you know, for our next future generations, we need to talk. We need to do this outside of this management system because the river panel system, their management progress or process is not working and we need to do this. So. This year, we're still planning a, a summit and hopefully it's going to bring together more people and we're coming up with different um, uh, planning processes and how we can get that communication across uh, right down to the Barren Sea from here. Um, I think that's going to be um, key in, 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 a, in having Chinook in the, in the river system. And just on that 2019 summit that we had, our pre- um, post river panel session last year there the Tanana people didn't put their nets in the water um certain people didn't put their nets in the water they said it's the high water we know it's low we're gonna let the the salmon go by we're gonna help out our neighbors i mean and I, we really thank them if, even though last year was the lowest number we've ever seen and we've missed some fish but um there, there's they, one, sorry one, one they, thing that I, sorry Brian. Yeah. Um, one thing to add to Harlan, just from a treaty perspective, is there's no penalties. There's no triggers or mechanisms uh, in the in the Yukon River Salmon Agreement when you miss escapement. There's absolutely no uh, penalty. The only penalty is uh, a $1.2 million compensation fund that the U.S. pays for restoration and enhancement every year. 
um, as we're in the in the Tucker River, for example, they've got provisions for enhancement and things like that, um, where you know they they'll propagate and that that's forced, but there's there's no penalties. I understand. So it has a bit of a taste of like the porcupine caribou management uh, international board that yep. it's more it's mostly there's yeah. no legislative there's no there's no teeth in it, but yep. it's just more of an educational uh, platform and. And and that's uh, that's kind of where it sits. So if you run into problems, you, you're I guess you're hoping for the best. Yeah, but you know what's good about that one, and this addresses what I what I heard Brandy just say. The like you know most of her values and priorities that came on that statement. The beauty of the Porcupine Management Board is they have users at the table that they're they're you know they bring down from Fort McPherson, they bring down from Sigachick, they bring down from from Dawson, and they actually the users are actually making decisions and recommendations around science and, and voluntary harvest restrictions is my understanding. Oh, That's okay. what... so, oh so this this Yukon River Salmon Committee, it, it really is bureaucrats at the... Uh, the Yukon River panel is not the Salmon Subcommittee, which is chapter 16, but the panel, yeah. the treaty, the treaty, it's like that picture I showed you, just a little, a few less ties. Right, okay. It's, it's a... Uh... And trust me, when I started back and I moved back here and I, you know, this was part of um, my portfolio as operations manager. And also like all of a sudden I was like, what am I digging my teeth into? This is crazy. Like there's such a process here and knowing all the moving parts, the Yukon Savage subcommittee, URFA, I mean, I'm gonna give you all these like, yeah, that's what they all said to me. And I was like, what does that mean? and Yukon River Panel and how does that play? And then you have all these um, local uh, initiatives and stuff. So um, like what we strive to do is simplify it and just like, okay, bring us back ground zero and let's build up and get everybody to play in because nobody knows all this. Like every time I try to explain to them, oh, the Yukon Salmon Subcommittee and then we have the River Panel and then we have the Alaskan Fish and Game and it's so confusing and if you just ground it about your your own values and what means what it means to your own um, people and then how that ties into the process is the number one thing is how to to go about it because it it was confusing and trust me nobody ever said Yukon salmon subcommittee they always said YSSC I'm like what is that and I imagine everybody here at the table is like uh oh uh, it, it like even RRC, which was a normal acronym when I came here, I was like, I don't even know what that means. So these are, are coming back here. These are the confusion. This is so confusing for so many people and how it maps out is um, up to us to bring forward. But I mean, like I said, we're always here. And if you ever have, you need a map drawn out how I'll place it. And one day I'll take this back to my own, my own lands department who keeps asking me questions. So it's not so confusing. Um, it, it just really proves how complex um, the salmon story is and our connections and weaving salmon connections, how complex it is and, and uh, what it means. And, and, and really when it should just be about Chinook, but there's all this political and bureaucratic system that goes into it that makes it so complicated that basically it should be coming from the salmon. And that's my um, perspective on how I look at things as I always say, let's bring it back to the salmon. What do they need from us? How can we do this to work with salmon? And how could they move up that river um, freely with us helping them along the way instead of us causing barriers? Anyway, that's my closing statement. <laughs> Uh, thank you. I, I, and I like your guys' line about we are all, all salmon people. So I think that's probably a great way to go about it. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah, Brandy and, and Dennis, thank you for joining us today. Uh, this has been a really great lecture. I think uh, you've provided a lot of value. And, and I mean, I learned a lot. Um, yeah, I just really appreciate you, uh, you know, taking the time to, to spend even more of your daylight hours on Zoom with us here. So thanks for that. Thanks everybody. Yeah, it's great, great uh, talking to you all. And I really appreciated your, the fact that you're all people that uh, live, a, live along a river of some sort as well. So appreciate that. Thanks. Yep.
goodness, Jis, Master Joe, Shani Tan, and you guys all have a great evening and a great weekend as well. Good night. Thank you. Nana Thank you. Thank you. And if anybody has questions about the assignment, I'm going to stick around for a few minutes. Uh, for that. that was a great lecture. I thought it was great. Um, it was really great. Yeah, it, was, it was great. Yeah, obviously, uh, I mean, I really believe, you know, Brandy could teach a course uh, and it wouldn't, yeah, she wouldn't have enough time to, to share all her knowledge. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's tremendous. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, they touched on a few things that I, I'm, I'll, I'm not going to keep this much longer. Uh, they touched on a few things that I, I was really excited about. Um, the importance of bringing groups together for a common discourse. Uh, it's something we've talked about a little bit in this course. Um, and seeing it out in the real world, uh, bringing groups together and sharing their stories um, as a, you know, an actual way of managing a resource. Um, and then the opposite of that, which is the bureaucratic, you know, um, I don't know, all those unhappy people and ties they showed uh, as an ineffective way of managing a resource, I think is also a, a good thing to, you know, really take note of it. There are some really complicated, really expensive management structures that we've created that don't work. And uh, it's okay for us to just say, hey, like, all these suits down in Ottawa aren't doing a good job. Let's change that. And let's, you know, let's come up with something that's better. Um, another point of Dennis's that I, I really wanted to reiterate was, you know, the fact that as we uh, get further away from that local scale, um, the, the local values get lost, right? So as you manage for a larger and larger scale, the local values um, get lost in the mix. And I think that that was a really important point as well. Um, I'm going to get the slide deck from them and I'll provide it on Moodle. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think we can all probably just take some time to digest all that information and uh, I'll post some notes. I've, I've taken maybe six or seven pages of notes here. Uh, so I'll post my notes on, on Moodle. If there's something that you really think is missing, uh, please, you know, let me know and I'll, I'll update my notes accordingly. Um, I'm not going to be assessing on any of the stuff that was part of this, but I do think it's a, it was a valuable lecture uh, to hear out anyway. Um, moving on to questions about assignment one. I don't know if there are any um, points of clarification or anything like that. Um, I don't think I have any questions. Right on. Uh, no questions for me. Okay. You guys, how are you guys finding it okay? <laughs> Okay. I'm sorry. I'm I'll stay at the question. Okay. Right on. I'll, I'll hang around uh, with Shirley here. I'll stop recording. Um,